And welcome to Primer Encuentro Relief. We are honored and glad to present Dr. Ray Yakendoff from Tuft University. Dr. Yakendoff is a prominent linguist and philosopher. He has written widely on syntax, semantics, the architecture and evolution of language, music cognition, and consciousness. He has served as president of both the Linguistic Society of America and the Society for Philosophy and Psychology. He's current, currently a research affiliate in brain and cognitive science at MIT and Emeritus Co-Director of the Center for Cognitive Studies at Taft University. Some of his most important publications are Languages of the Mind, Essays on Mental Representation, Foundations of Language, Brain, Meaning, Grammar, and Evolution, Simpler Syntax with Peter Kulikover, Meaning and the Lexicon, The Parallel Architecture, 1975-2010, and A User's Guide to Thought and Meaning. Thank you, Ray, for giving us your insights about linguistics. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm honored to be able to speak to you today. And uh, the organizers here have uh, asked me to talk briefly about my own personal views on the uh, state of linguistics and my hopes for the future. So here goes. Not easy to, to do. But I think for, for me and for much of the field, the central unifying issue is the question of what makes up humans' knowledge of language. And I want to take this term knowledge of language, not just as a metaphor and not just a mantra that we pronounce at the beginning of everything we do. I want to take it very literally. Um, if it's knowledge, it has to be somewhere in your memory. It has to be in your head somehow or another. And this is what puts linguistics squarely in the study of the mind and the brain. So a more upfront way of putting the question is, what kinds of mental representations do we store in memory when we know a language? And how are these representations put to use? And that leads to the question, of course, of how the knowledge gets there. How do people learn languages? And in order to answer that question, we can go on and ask, what sort of mental equipment do you need in order to acquire a language? And I think these questions are at the basis of modern linguistic theory. And they're what connects linguistics with the cognitive sciences and eventually with biology, we hope. Um, so with these questions in mind, I wanna talk for a moment about one of the big challenges for the field. And it's one that, uh, it's a challenge that's been a source of disappointment for me for many years. We, I think everybody conceives of language as a mapping between sound and meaning. But if you look at the predominant theories of the components of language, you find they don't really connect with each other to give us this mapping. The minimalist program in syntax, it doesn't look at all like formal truth conditional semantics. And neither of them has anything whatsoever to do with optimality theory and phonology. So how do these pieces fit together to do the things language needs to do? We're stuck with something that's sort of like a beast with the head of a lion, the body of a camel, and maybe the tail of a chicken. And you know, none of these three looks much like something the brain can do in the course of comprehending or producing language. Um, another thing that's bothered me a lot is the field's emphasis on totally productive phenomena, uh, focus, focusing on Humboldt's famous phrase, the, the infinite use of finite means. This is all well and good, but um, in addition, lots of our knowledge of language is idiosyncratic or only partia partially general. Uh, the theory tells us these things aren't really important. They're peripheral, we can ignore them. What's important is the rules of grammar. Not nearly so much attention gets paid to the lexicon, which is regarded as a list of basic irregularities or in the terms of DeShillo and Williams, a collection of the lawless. But remember, I mean, suppose we know, say, a thousand rules. That seems like a whole lot of rules to know. But we also know at least 50,000 words. That is, the bulk of our knowledge of language is in the lexicon, and yet the theory isn't interested in it. Something is wrong. Uh, well, a trend in the field that I find encouraging for the future is the development of constructionist theories of language, like construction grammar, construction morphology, cognitive grammar, some varieties of HPSG, and uh, my own per 
uh, parallel architecture. Um, these approaches posit a very rich lexicon that's stored in memory, and it contains not just words or morphemes, but thousands of idioms and multi-word collocations and meaningful syntactic constructions that are all part of our knowledge of language. Um, and this constructionist approach addresses the issues that I brought up a moment ago. I mean, it gives you some nice ways to talk about productive versus partially productive patterns in language. It also gives you some nice ways to connect the grammar and the lexicon directly with language comprehension and production. So it breaks down the firewall between competence and performance that has separated linguistic theory from psycholinguistics for over 50 years. And finally, I think the constructionist approach gives us the possibility of unifying phonology, syntax, and semantics with each other into a unified picture of how language works. And very importantly, it, we have the possibility of, unif of unifying language with the rest of the mind, which would be terrific. Now, I don't have time today to even begin to tell you how all this very grand stuff works. So I'll just refer you to my well-known book, Foundations of Language, and actually to my most recent book called Foundations, uh, called The Texture of the Lexicon, which I wrote with Jenny Audrey. Um, another issue that I think it's important to mention is the nature of language learning. What does it take for you to be able to learn your language, as I mentioned earlier? And generative linguistics has always posited that human minds contain a species specific and biologically determined universal grammar that guides language learning. And the particular hypotheses about what universal grammar looks like have varied over the years, of course. But what's important to notice is that they've always been opposed at every stage by a wide, widely held dogma that there's nothing special about language learning compared to other kinds of learning. We don't really need a UG. We just learn language through experience, whatever that is. And this, in, this insistence is found in cognitive grammar, much of construction grammar, many functionalist approaches, and above all in connectionism and statistical learning. Um, and I think it's very dangerous. Uh, my own position is we have to treat the existence and the nature of universal grammar as an empirical question, and we have to keep an open mind about it. It might turn out that, that uh, there is nothing special about language learning, but we can't take that as an unquestionable dogma. We have to be open to other possibilities. That leads me to a last point, which is sort of more sociological, I guess. It seems to me that many linguists and psycholinguists have taken the view that linguistic theory has gotten too complex and unintuitive, and they've decided to just forget about theory. Uh, they may say something like, well, I'm just interested in describing languages, or I'm just using the framework I was taught. It, it's a convenient tool, but I, it doesn't matter whether it's the right one or not. But, you know, any kind of description needs terms that you can use to describe the phenomena you're working on. Things don't come with their own labels. Your choice of labels is a, is a sort of theory, whether you like it or not. Um, and if your theory or your means of description isn't working, you have to be ready to fix it. The hard part is really allowing yourself to notice when it's not working and allowing yourself to figure out whether you can get by with a little change in your story or whether you have to dig deeper and maybe even challenge some basic assumptions of your framework. Or you might have to give up your framework entirely. It takes a lot of imagination and care to get all these questions right and to dream up the right set of potential counterexamples. And you have to have an awareness of what alternatives are out there beyond the little problem you're working on and the particular way you have of working on it. It takes a lot of courage to question the framework you've been taught and uh, the, the framework that everyone around you accepts. There's a frightening sense of being disconnected from your support system. You have to live, you have to learn to live with that sense of insecurity and if possible, go through it with a sense of joy and a sense of exploration. Uh, in the face of that uh, sort of uncertainty, how can you tell if you're on the right track? You feel unmoored. In my own experience, I, I think I've been happiest when, with a revision or innovation in the theory. 
if it not only fixes the problem I'm working on, but it also gives me insight into other phenomena that I'd never connected this one with. For an extreme example, what is it that made Newton's theory of, gravitational, of gravitation so great? Well, it was that it explained not only the apple falling on his head, but the tides and planetary motion, for goodness sake. You know, I mean, none of us can hope to be that cosmic, but I think it's what uh, we should be striving for in our own relatively modest ways. Now, maybe I'm being too idealistic for these difficult times. I'm not sure whether being a rebel will get you a job, but it's in the nature of science to be idealistic. I think if we can't be uh, at least a bit idealistic, what's the point? Well, I think that's enough uh, of a sermon for today. Um, I want to express my thanks again to the organizers for making it possible to speak to you. And please, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to email me. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. That was really interesting. And I have um, written down a question regarding uh, the relation between experimental linguistics or psycholinguistics and linguistics. And I think you have already uh, touched um, that area, but I don't know if you want to add something about uh, what do you think or if do you think there is enough dialogue nowadays between these two areas, I mean, psycholinguistics and linguistics, or um, what can we do to, um, or what can, could be done to bridge these two areas? Yeah, I, I think um, there could, it, it's a very um, encouraging move that more linguists are turning to psycholinguistic evidence. Um, the psycholinguists are working mostly in a linguistic theory that's you might call the um, common sense view of linguistic theory, right? I mean, they don't, they're not looking for evidence for abstract functional categories and movement and those sorts of things. They're looking at phenomena like uh, processing of object relative clauses and extraction constraints and things like that that are right there pretty much on the surface in any theory. Um, I've been involved in a couple of efforts to bring psycholinguistics to a wider range of phenomena, things like coercion, um, where, or, and light verb constructions, where you, can, you don't need a very sophisticated linguistic theory to see what's going on here, but you need, and, and how do I want to put this? This is pushing me towards a linguistic theory that addresses the, that um, speaks to the things that psycholinguists are studying and doesn't go that far beyond it. I mean, uh, and, and that's a property of, of uh, uh, the parallel architecture and some of the constructionist theories. Other questions? Yes. Yes, yes, that's right. And well, that touches also the other question I have written down. So you are um, yeah. connecting the questions for me. That was, um, aside from your recent book on morphology and the parallel architecture, what are you currently working on? Um, right, <laughs> right now, I'm involved in a big project with Peter Kulikover on parenthetical constructions. Um, parentheticals turn out to be hugely rich and uh, fascinating, there, there are at least seven different kinds of parentheticals, each one with different properties. And some of it is just gazing in wonder at this whole new source of data about how language works. And the thing about parentheticals is that they're sort of disconnected from the sentence they live in. And now the, the question is when there is interaction between them, how do you characterize it? And can uh, contemporary linguistic theory, I mean, even the, the, the simpler syntax that Kulikover and I have uh, been pushing, how do you extend that to, to these kinds of constructions? Things like, um, you know, John is, in everyone's opinion, smarter than Chomsky. I don't know. Um, but there are things like, in everyone's opinion, to my regret, as you probably know, um, among others, um, 
what are some of the other ex well uh even things like john hey you'll be really interested in this thinks that the earth is flat so you can jam a whole sentence into the middle of a sentence as a parenthetical um how does the theory of grammar let us do this so that's the big project um i have a paper under submission with uh, Jenny Audring and uh, Paul Kudig on uh, prediction in language processing, where we think it uh, follow, let's see if I can describe this in a few words. <laughs> um, there's been a lot of talk recently in the psycholinguistic world about prediction, how you're predicting in advance. And we're asking the question, what's the form of a prediction and where do the, what generates the predictions? And it turns out in, on our view that it's the lexicon, of course. So you make a prediction when you have heard the beginning of something that you've pulled from the lexicon and the, your prediction is you're gonna hear the rest of it. Very simple. Um, you don't need a, a separate executive function that is making the predictions. So that's the other major project. I'm working on reflexives with a student from Harvard, Shannon Bryant. I'm working on some sort of vague stuff at the moment, but it's beginning to take shape on music with Jay Kaiser. Um, is that enough? Yes, yes, perfect. <laughs> you are working in more stuff than we are, definitely. And can, can I don't know if you will allow this, but can I ask? Uh, I'll, one more question regarding um, your prediction paper. So how would you say uh, this um, theory of prediction um, considering, considering the lexicon uh, will interact with the information from the context? Ah, yes. Um, well, the information from the context also has to be stored someplace to say this context has these consequences. It has, and within the um, um, within the morphological theory in the new book, there's the possibility in the lexicon of what we call relational links that say these things are related to one another. They're the same in certain respects. And the context is going to be uh, interacting with your knowledge of possible contextual interactions with the things that you're paying attention to. Um, and it'll have the effect of speeding up processing, presumably, or slowing it down if, if what you're hearing is in conflict with the context. Well, great. Thank you. This has been amazing. <laughs>